This is Dr. Warren Vanderhill interviewing Dr. James Kirkwood, Emeritus Professor of Industry and Technology for the Ball State History Project. It is November 15th, 2004. Jim, I want to thank you for agreeing to help me with my project, and I'd like to ask you to begin by reflecting a little bit on your educational background, where you're from, etc., before you came to Ball State. What I want to do here is sort of have Kirkwood did all this, and then for whatever reason decided to come to Ball State. Hmm. So, well, it was that way back when. Uh, yeah, I went to Catholic schools and uh, lived in Buffalo, New York, and then uh, went to Detroit, Michigan, and went to school there from fourth to sixth grade. And my father was ill. We came back from there to Lancaster, New York, a small town outside of Buffalo. And uh, I, well, I, went, I went through sixth grade, uh, St. Mary's High School, from sixth grade on through twelfth grade. It was uh, all in one building. I never went to kindergarten. We never had kindergarten <laughs> at that time back there in St. Margaret's in Buffalo. But anyway, my father did die almost immediately, right, as soon as I turned eleven, and uh, that influenced our finances of our family. We lived with my immigrant grandparents from Germany, and so I learned to understand a little German, but uh, never learned to speak it very well. They died, so I had three significant adults in my life die between the time I was 11 and 15. <coughs> so at school, I think I was fairly depressed <laughs> in high school. <laughs> and uh, I think everybody's depressed in high school. Yeah, well, I don't know. And uh, <laughs> the, uh, the nuns at one time thought I would make a great priest because I was quiet and shy and fairly <laughs> intelligent, but I got such terrible grades. I mean, I hated school. I didn't like anybody encroaching on my time. So I never did any homework. I never took any books home. And um, I'd copy my homework from some girl in the morning you know, before school started. And that's how I got through. I graduated third lowest from my high school class. My cousin was lower than I and one other guy who, whose father was a millionaire. Um, they went on to Niagara University, by the way, the, the two lowest ones. And there's only a couple others that went on to college. And uh, at the time, I was probably, in terms of ability, I was like the second highest in the class. It was a small class, with like 32 kids. Um, then I went to work in a factory, didn't know what else to do. My mother said she'd pay for me to go to Notre Dame to school, but I knew she couldn't afford it because there weren't, there weren't scholarships at that time. <coughs> and I didn't, I, I just didn't think college was for me. All of a sudden I saw these other people getting awards and I got nothing. So I just went to work in a factory. And finally, after three years, I finally realized that I was smarter than many of the other people there and that this was not going to be my life especially seeing some of my friends coming back from college and then going out with them uh, to drink a beer or down on the lake or something. So um, I liked being outside and I was stuck in this factory and uh, I had one week's vacation in three years. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> and then I took a couple of days off to deer hunt, that's about it. Um, so I went to Erie County Technical Institute. I thought well, construction technology sounded good. I'd be outside and all that. Yeah. And uh, I was a B student. and. Uh, I had to go back to study again, which was difficult. I didn't, I never had studied. I shouldn't say go back to study. I'd never studied in my life. So I got myself a little place to study and immediately realized that I, I was doing, nobody else was studying, it was just me. Yeah, so I was doing pretty well. Went through school, wanted to come to St. Lawrence Seaway for uh, my internship. I had a car accident, almost killed myself. And um, came back and finished school. And then I worked at the Buffalo Airport, uh, was drafted into the Army, or I volunteered for the draft because all the rest of my friends were going. I thought it was a thing to do. While I was there, I went to Rutgers, and that's when I got the Rutgers experience. I spent a year and a half at Rutgers uh, taking one or two classes uh, a semester, mm -hmm. most of which I thought would translate or transfer to um, some college. And I was thinking about uh, Northern Michigan University. Oh. Yeah. And, uh, because they, they would take the credits from the Erie County Technical right. Institute, whereas University of Buffalo wouldn't, which right. had an engineering school. So I thought about that, or Tri-State, and then uh, finally decided, well, the University, the, the Buffalo State Teachers College had this thing in something called industrial arts, and you right. could work with your hands and, uh, and become a teacher. I thought, well, I didn't want to become a teacher. I thought this would give me the opportunity to get a college degree, and then I can go back and work for the, uh, when I worked up in the St. Lawrence Seaway, I worked for, uh, the United States uh, Coast and Geodetic Survey, and uh, I guess that's what it's And uh, that was a good experience up there. It was a lot of fun, and uh, I learned a lot about people and myself. And so. um, let me see where I'm at. Uh, you've gone from Rutgers, now you're doing Rutgers. You got your degree. Finishing my degree, uh, and uh, <coughs> so I went back to I went to Buffalo State and talked to some people there, and they said. That, uh, 
I talked to Rex Miller, who's a, a well-known author in our field, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he had service time, and you know, he mm -hmm. just identified with me being a veteran, and he mm -hmm. sort of took me under his wing and said, "Look, have you gonna got to come back to school right away?" Because I didn't know what to do, and he, no, he said, "Start school right away." I said, "But I can make all this kind of money right now. I'm making really good money." He said, "You're gonna make a lot better money when you get out. Get to school immediately." So I started in that September. Of, that was in 1961. I'd gotten out of the army in 1960. Uh, graduated in 1963. Uh, I got through in two years. I was able to, I was one of these people who knew how to rearrange things. And I graduated third highest in my <laughs> college class, and uh, which I thought was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Having gone from third lowest to third highest. And uh, then uh, stayed on for a year and taught uh, at Buffalo as a, as a part time instructor. It was sort of a graduate assistantship, but I was officially a part time instructor and taught there. Then Rex uh, found me the job in Oak Park, Illinois, teaching in the elementary grades. And I thought, that this is where this industrial arts makes sense, is in the elementary school. Right. And so I went there and uh, taught for two years. They treated us terrible. They, you know, if you're an elementary school teacher, you weren't as good as the high school <laughs> teachers. You know, and they were getting much bigger races from the same school district. <laughs> and um, so five of us left that, that, that year, five of us elementary teachers left mm -hmm. to teach in the university. Oh, I thought that was pretty cool for yeah. this, you know, school yeah. district. And um, so again, Rex Miller had uh, found me the job at Buffalo, and he found me the job in, in Oak Park, Illinois, and he found me the job. I'm sorry, had, had found me the job then at uh, Ball State. Well, did he have some connections with faculty? Uh, yeah, I think he knew Lloyd Nelson pretty okay. well, and because uh, we, and the funny thing is that we had gone to a conference okay. in Indianapolis, and uh, Rex took a few of the students, including me. And under, I was still an undergraduate at the yeah. time. I think I was a senior, and we went down and we stopped in at Ball State and met uh, Lloyd Nelson, who was at that time department chair. Right. And uh, I just loved the campus at Ball oh. State. I thought, wow, this is so good. And Buffalo was so dirty, you know. <laughs> just, and, and people would go to, I mean, out of it, we'd get up another dormitory, and the girls would wear their pajamas to class <laughs> in a coat and go back to bed again after their 8 o'clock class. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the halls were always filthy in the, in the buildings. and. Uh, Ball State was just so clean and neat, and everybody was wearing chinos and plaid shirts. <laughs> and I thought that was just the neatest campus. Plus, it was a little warmer. The Prosythia was moving right, when we came right. through, and of course, up in Buffalo, we still have snow on the streets. And uh, so, anyway, I, I taught them for two years. Came to came to Ball State through uh, Rex Miller's uh, help. He and I, he he uh, was re referred me and another fellow named Jim Vigiani to. Buffalo, or Ball State, and we both came here and interviewed. Uh, the interesting thing was Jim and I were, uh, he, although he'd been there for four years at Buffalo State, when I started, I started arguing with him in class because we had different <laughs> views. Then we started dating the girl who was uh, Miss Buffalo. Eventually came in second, or was the first one up in the Miss New York State contest. We were both dating her. And then we both got interviewed for this job. Of course, I'd gotten married just before that, not to her, but to somebody else, to Audrey. And uh, so I got the job. Uh, I was real pleased with it, and I really, I was, I wanted to leave uh, Oak Park, so I, I, I really didn't think about any other choices. When this job came okay. up, it was perfect. The job was perfect because it, what it did was allow me to teach in the elementary grades, but mm -hmm. teach it the way I wanted to, which was to involve the, the, the classroom teacher in what I was doing with the little kids, and it gave me a chance to teach the college students about what I was doing. Right. So my, my career essentially was teaching yeah. the little kids and then showing adults how to go, go about teaching little kids in uh, technology education, or industrial arts at that time, but then became technology education. What, what were your expectations of a faculty member when you came? Oh, I, I was just talking about that with somebody else the other day. You know, we came and, uh, you know, we expected to teach. Okay. Well, we taught 16 hours. Well, that was our load was 16 hours. So I, I, I taught something like 10 or 12 hours over at Burris. And uh, then I still taught two, at least one more class. Right. These were uh, quarter hour classes, right. so right. those were four quarter hour classes, so uh, my load was at least 16 hours, yeah. and uh, so it was like having two jobs, because right. I taught there in the morning, and then uh, some of the guys would go over to the gym, and so I became a member of the Fat Faculty Club, <laughs> and, you know, and I uh, started running oh, and yeah. doing all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But it was like having two jobs, but nevertheless, I really enjoyed myself, I thought it was great. I, you know, I would get so involved, I, I would, I'd find my lunch on my desk at 5.30 or 6 o'clock at night, you know, <laughs> and I'd forgotten to eat it, I just got so busy all day long. Well, and you, you mentioned that in the context of, of why you came here, which is pretty atypical, I have to say, for most faculty I've talked to. When you look back on your long, and I'd say, distinguished career here, why did you stay? Well, uh, 
I don't know. I never had stayed any place more than three years in my life. I'd worked in you know, three years at, at the factory, and uh, other than that, I'd never been anything. You know, that was the longest I'd been in any place, and so I figured I'd probably be here that long, maybe five at the very most. But then we came here. We had one child, had just had our second child, and they were only 14 months apart. And Audrey became pregnant uh, the day after we got here. Yeah. And uh, so the third one came along. So we had three boys in 27, 28 months. So we, I was wrapped up at home. Yeah, right. And my job was to teach. Right. Uh, I didn't have to write. I didn't have to present. Right. I didn't like presenting. And I still don't. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I do like to write, though. Yeah. Uh, okay. But at the time, you didn't need to. I think I remember uh, getting an article published about an activity I was doing. And mm -hmm. I t called the newspaper, and they came out and took pictures and interviewed me and interviewed me. And uh, we, we sent up rockets. It was something I had right. done at first, and I started doing yeah. it with the adults. And the, the adults loved it, and everybody else was sort of fascinated by this. But this is not, remember, 1966. And uh, so it was not, uh, you know, rocketry was just, you know, we were just learning all kinds of things that were happening with rock, rocket and space science. So I got that in the paper, and I remember that, you know, the department chair and his administrative assistant said, wow, this is just great. You know, <laughs> you know I mean, they get your name in the paper. I've been here for 10 years, and I have never got my name in the paper. You know, they never thought about writing. And then I, I realized that I needed a book, we needed readings. And I said, well, I, following Rex Miller's steps, who had put out a book of readings, I got all the readings and put them together and got them published through Brown, which is what we call Vanity Press yeah, kind of thing. Right. But got them to publish um, that. And wow, that was really something to have a book yeah. in my second year. At the end of my second year, I had a book. And uh, so I enjoyed that part. And uh, you know, writing was fairly stiff at the time. I went on to Purdue. I uh, went one year there and would have been the third year teaching here, so 66, 67, 68. 68 to 69, I went there, came back, and I did all my coursework there. I taught, seven, I, I took 17 hours each semester, taught uh, one course, mm -hmm. and I uh, studied for and passed my French. <laughs> I got my, uh, you know, I got every, I did all my exams, everything, I got everything out of the way. So when I came back, all I had to do was my dissertation. When did you finish that? And I finished that in a year. I did an experimental study with my class oh, okay. and uh, David P. Ossadel's theory of advanced organizers. How do you spell P. Ossadel? David P. Ossadel, A-U-S-U-B-E-L. Oh. Okay. And uh, so it was interesting. So anyway, that came back yeah. and then I stayed there. The reason I stayed, I think, was because of the children. And uh, I thought in 1970, when I did get my degree, which had having been here four years, this would have been a good time to move. But I didn't see any jobs. At that time, the job market seemed to be closed to me. At least that was my understanding of it. As I look back on it now, it probably wasn't. Yeah. And there probably but you didn't really pursue other openings. No, I never looked at anything else. I, the only time I really interviewed, I interviewed for a job when I was 65. <laughs> and I got it. Yeah. And I turned it down, but oh, they, okay. I, I, they made the offer to me, okay. which I was really strange. Yeah, I, I thought that the funny part there was they were earning, full professors there were earning uh, a third more than I was earning here. Yeah. Which shouldn't come as any surprise, but yeah. that, we'll get to that question later. <laughs> uh, in, in what ways did Ball State change during your career? Well, I mean, it was in a was in a process. Well, the year before I came here is when I became the university right. from college, and um, and then Missouri Auditorium was put in. And they thought of themselves more in terms of town and gown, and right. all of a sudden, I think they became aware of themselves as being, hey, this is you know not a bad place, not a bad university, and the, the university saw themselves more on the national scene than they had in the past. And uh, I began to think that way too as uh, I got, went through the 70s. And, uh, you know, I, I became sort of, I was more one of the rebel faculties. I identify with a lot of the, the faculty who were doing that. Uh, Pat Struve, uh, remember him from mm -hmm, yeah. Education and Higher And uh, I can't remember his name now, but. Uh, Department? Department Chairman. He, he was retired. And, I'm not sure if he's still alive. Mm. Uh, anyway, a couple of the guys that, that did a lot of stuff. So I got a lot involved with a lot of photography and, and mm -hmm. trying to show things of that were anti-war protests and yeah, anti-poverty yeah. things. I did some work with the uh, Council of Churches and put on mm -hmm. a, a poverty thing, uh, slide tape presentation. I got known for my slide tape presentations until I, I and I started presenting in lots of different classes yeah. until I realized that the only reason they wanted me there was it took up an hour and they didn't have to prepare for it. Because I would ask for ten bucks or so, to, you know, for films, for you know, and they would. So, oh, we don't, we don't have that kind of money. So then I don't have the time either. So I stopped doing that. Well, well, you mentioned that your your interest in coming here was really as a teacher. Yep, absolutely. And, and, yeah. and certainly one of the really significant changes that occurred during your time and my time at Ball State was uh, 
the change from a strict teaching orientation to what we have now come to call teacher scholar yeah. and scholarly productivity and putting in different standards for tenure and promotion to associate full professor, mm -hmm. um, merit market pay packages and things like that. And I, I'd like you to, to comment on how you viewed those changes as they occurred oh, kind of about halfway through your career here. Yeah, well, even earlier than that, the, the, I was promoted to full professor. With, I came in as an instructor. Right. I had one course beyond my master's right. degree. And uh, so I, I have always been able to see the writing on the wall. Yeah, and, sure. it, you know, it was get a degree right away right. as fast as you can and to get the, another 30 hours in yeah. And it was automatic then assistant right. professor. So I did that the first year. I had 30 hours in. I took some courses in the summer. I went to Purdue. I went and took some courses during the year. And the next summer I went to Purdue and started my, my doctorate. Ended up at 30, so I ended up as an assistant professor. Four years, I was associate, and four years more, I was right. co-professor. So nine years, I went all the way. And, uh, but all that was based mostly on teaching. Right. But again, you began to see the emphasis on writing right. and, and you know, making presentations mm -hmm. right. and uh, a lot of service kinds of things. And uh, Getting grants? Getting grants. I never, we did, our, our department still uh, really lacks the ability right. to do so. I mean, we, we've got some, a few people have done that, yeah. but we're not good grant writers, and you know, okay. we're, not, we're not we're not research oriented. My degree at Purdue, however, was research oriented. So, um, of course, when I came out of there, then I, I saw that, but I still didn't have time. I had you know, now I had five children, right. and, uh, right. and and Burris was a tremendous load. I mean, yeah. teaching at Burris yeah. is uh, it was a full time job. Yeah. Plus, I taught at the university right. almost right. full time, yeah. and. Uh, so I didn't have time. I thought when I hit 50, I'm going to start writing. Well, I came, I was 31, so we're right. talking about 20 more years. Yeah. But in that length of time, I think I did mature. I began to realize that I knew things that other people didn't know. Right. Um, and that I was becoming an expert in the field of elementary school technology right. education. Yeah. And uh, so I started writing when I was 50. Okay. And uh, from the time I was 50. So you really, fit, you really fit in then with this new model. Oh, I, I liked it. I enjoyed it. And in fact, I think it was you know, it's quite probable. What happened was we winnowed out a lot of people as soon as that those the new standards for promotion and so on right. merit pay uh, those who didn't see the writing on the wall and mm -hmm. were gone right. and, and they, they couldn't hack it and our department was unfortunately i guess in some ways uh, was able to keep people on who did not have their doctor right and they were allowed to do that yeah. grandfathered in essentially yeah. Yeah. and exactly. uh, so yeah. and, and began to see that the technical expertise was as good as writing um, mm -hmm. which it Probably is. I, you know, the emphasis. You know, the pendulum swings and it sure. swings back again. So the pendulum swung pretty far for a while. Right. It's still pretty far over there. But as far as these people were concerned, that pendulum was way out out of balance, and they were able to hang on, nevertheless. Yeah. Do, and, do, you, do you see these kinds of changes at Ball State as negative or positive? Oh, I see them as positive. I think. Oh yeah. I, uh, I don't think we lack that much in teaching compared to what we did have in the past. Right. Um, we still have, uh, and our uh, faculty, uh, as I left, that we still have people who are pretty much see themselves as teachers. Okay. Uh, a lot of our faculty, though, are also service kind of people. They right. want to do right. other kinds of things. So right. we had a lot of people doing service things, and uh, you know, chair, I mean, president of this association or the sub the, the committees and so on. And they really enjoy doing that. I never did. I, I'm not much of a schmoozer as, as, <laughs> as a lot of other people are. I, I'm much more content to sit down and write. Uh, and I really like doing that. Well, uh, I started writing for um, the Who's Your Runner yeah, right. publication yeah, for the state right. and uh, was told how good I was. And then they, they were pushing me to write for the paper. So I started writing for the yeah. paper. All this is about the same time I'm 50. So I really learned how to write by writing a weekly article for the paper, which abs counted for absolutely nothing in my department. <laughs> right. In fact, it was it counted against me because yeah. I should have been doing yeah. writing in the yeah. Yeah. not realizing that it only took me an hour and a half to write a, a Mm -hmm. a four or five page article. I'm just a fast writer. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, who, are, who are some of the people in your career who have had an impact on you? Well, Rex Miller probably as okay. much as anybody. Then I, there was a fellow by the name of Virgil Fry who was a friend of Rex Miller, so that's how I ended up in Oak Park, Illinois. Okay. Cause that's where he taught. And he and I have been friends ever since okay. then. I, I, w I used to sit at his house. We would s sit and discuss technology yeah. education yeah. and uh, teaching in general and life in general and he's five years older than me as, as Rex was and um, 
don't know, he's just been a, a friend and a mentor ever since. And uh, helped me move down here, encouraged me to leave both parts, yeah. and said this would be a great career to yeah. move and all the rest of that stuff. Uh, yeah, I, but, you know, I, we weren't encouraged to, to write. I don't think we had, uh, in terms of researching, uh, we, we, we have had some support for that all, all right. along. Terry Schur was yeah. very helpful in a couple, right. well, even on my doctoral dissertation, yeah. he was yeah. helpful on that. He or his predecessor, I'm not really right. sure. Uh -huh. I think it was Terry, though. Yeah. And uh, then I have done a few research articles, uh -huh. besides a lot of fluff articles. Or right. I, I, you can't, not really fluff, but they're... You know, it's a good, a good combination. Well, it's a simple kind, you know, yeah. simple article. See, so here's what okay. I did, you know, yeah. and, and, and people like that, essentially it's applied research. Mm -hmm. you know, I took this idea and here's how it worked out. Okay. But I have done other kinds of research articles. In fact, there's only a few in our, in our department that have ever published research articles. Mm -hmm. I mean, like three people. T tell me a little bit about areas of uh, involvement of the university. Are there any special service areas that particularly interested you during your career? I mean, obviously, people have to do something in the category of service, and some people, I think, get consumed by it. Well, yeah. I'm kind of concerned, or, or kind of interested in any service areas that might have been of interest to you. Well, I, no, I, I never liked, I never liked going to meetings. Uh, I always felt that every time I went to a conference, it was people showing off what they had done and right. putting down what you had done. And uh, you know, having grown up poor and having yeah. suffered from that, you know, yeah. as my sister said, all of my friends say, you know, I, we grew up poor, but we didn't know it. She said, yeah. we knew it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so I guess I felt that same way when I went to these yeah. conferences. I was sort of like the poor guy. I wasn't doing anything yeah. that the other people were doing. And, okay. and yet I found out I was doing more than what they yeah. were doing and that they were the getting the recognition <laughs> for it. And uh, so I finally learned that I had to do some of that. I did become uh, president of the, of the uh, Technology Education for Children Council for three years. Mm -hmm. Normally it's two. And I was on the board of directors of the um, Technology Education Association uh, for two years. And, uh, you know, got a lot out of that mm -hmm. uh, and became recognized by other people. Okay. But there were some people in our department who kept me down, who, who purposely put out bad information about me on campus and mm -hmm. off campus in the association. I was not allowed to present. I mean, I was really, yeah. I was blackballed. Uh -huh. But I was, as I said, a rebel, and they didn't like that. It was this yeah. extremely conservative bunch of people okay. that I teach with. You think your feels? You think your feels a conservative feel? Extremely. Okay. Yeah, extremely. Why? why what accounts for that? Uh, I have no idea. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I mean, you know, you know, on the listserv, and you'll see. I mean, people get into the politics, and all of a sudden, you hear all, all these ultra conservative kinds of comments that are just, uh -huh. I mean, disturbing to me. I can't, I can't get with that at all. You know? uh -huh. Uh, so in that way, of course, me walking around in bell bottoms and a yeah, yeah, Fu Manchu yeah. mustache. You know, I, mean, I was I was yeah. a latent a hippie yeah. at the time, and uh, that that put a lot of people on. Yeah, a lot of the guys. The other thing that was put off was 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 being a Catholic. Oh, okay. Being a Catholic in a Protestant environment, yeah. uh, to the point well, where this is a real Protestant department. Real Protestant it was at the time okay. when I first came here. I, I replaced the Catholic. I was the only other Catholic. <laughs> token guy. Catholic. Yeah, apparently, I was a token Catholic. <laughs> Uh, but you know, there was this <coughs> feeling that Catholics were these strange bunch of people. I mean, you know, you hear people yeah. talk to, in the hills will say, oh, they have horns, yeah, or they right, have tails, right. and all the rest of this thing. Yeah. But some of them sort of half believed that, I think. And that and that idea that, well, you can't trust Catholics sort of persisted. Yeah. Even though the, 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 the beginnings of that feeling right. about you can't trust Catholics, that applied to me, yeah. was you can't trust Kirkwood. And this sort of filtered on down through, even though the beginnings of it were lost. And uh, you know, I, I've, always, I've always thought myself as a very trustworthy person. Yeah, I, and, I have. Maybe that, come, well, you're talking but, about the Cape Cod Department of I'm war. talking about the, yeah, yeah, in a, in a sense. And, and you, you know, and I should have gone someplace else because yeah. of that. I should have gone another place and lost that reputation. Now I see that yeah. quite, quite clearly. Yeah. But being here was, you know, was still it was, it was a, it was a great place to be. I, I enjoyed it. I, uh, well, let me pick up on that a little bit more because the other area I want to ask you about where I know you've done some interesting things is tell me about your special areas of involvement in the community. Uh, well, I, as I told you, I wrote, wrote from the paper, right. and I think that was a service kind of thing that, yeah. that was really worthwhile doing. Right. Uh, as far as I was concerned, as far yeah. as the department was concerned, no, it was not. It was, it was, but your fellow runners appreciated it. Oh yeah, and I still get I still get lots of lots of good yeah. feedback from that. I, in fact, I applied. I'm, I'm student. I'm student. I'm participant. No, 
is the right word, <laughs> substitute teaching. Uh -huh. Uh, just just to get in with the kids every now yeah. and then. I, I thought if I could do one or two, three days a month, that would be great. You're a glutton for punishment. No, no, I enjoyed them. I enjoy the kids very much. You're talking I, about I was, Muncie City Schools? I'm talking about Delaware Community Schools. Oh, okay. Yep, so Delta and yeah. uh, the local elementary. So I was hoping I could just roll down the hill on my bike to, to Albany and teach in the elementary oh, class. But I got into the middle school twice now, and I really enjoyed yeah. that. Oh, and, um, good for you. The kids think I'm awesome. They told me that. They said, you're, you're awesome, teacher. You know, because I, well, I, you are. I treat them as individuals. I've learned right. how to do that. Right. Of course, by now, after 38, 9, 40 years of teaching. You know how to do it. I mean, if they can't do anything, <laughs> they can't do anything somebody else hasn't already right. done. And, uh, right. and numerous times. Yeah. Um, so my involvement in the community, I guess, would be that run, the running part. Um, You've done a lot in church. Uh, oh, yeah. And, well, and I think that was the main thing. I, I, it was it, for a long while. It, it became I, I I couldn't tell you when I was working and when I wasn't working. I mean, I'd be going over to church and working with the kids over there, but still I was there. I was their friend, but I was still was a teacher. But I was still Jim, you know. Yeah. And uh, well, did you have something to do, or maybe a lot to do with the Newman Center? Yeah, with the Newman yeah. Center. So I did with the kids. I played the guitar right. with them and sang with them, and I still do. Uh, now at this age, I'm no longer. Jim, <laughs> I'm not I'm one of the gang. Before, I was just right. like an older brother. Now, yeah. I'm like their great grandfather. Right, with a um, guitar. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, but it's, you know, I can see how, how how I don't really yeah. mesh with them. But at the time, I really yeah. meshed with the students a lot. And kids would drift in and out of my office, yeah. and uh, you know, if they had a problem, they might come see me, which I thought was pretty cool. I mean, I thought that was really nice. So I, it was really difficult to say yeah. when I was done teaching because if I went over the Newman Center, which I did at least once a week, sure. uh, or twice a week, and um, I was teaching there too. So my involvement is with, with church and then okay. with the writing. Big question. I know we've talked about this a lot in our conversations. What, what's your perspective on the, the role of the faculty in Boston? What do you, what do you, think, well, of, I, what do you I, think the faculty voice should be? Well, I, first of all, I think we should be a community of scholars where, where open discussion is, is permissible, where we should, we should have uh, university constantly happening. We should be able to walk across campus and see somebody and sit down now we've got the, the, the uh, atrium, right, which is pretty nice for that, because yeah. you can say, hey, you know, we're talking about this, let's go over, let's yeah. sit down and have a cup of coffee and talk about this. Yeah. You know, and you can sit down and talk, but, and, and the other thing that you and I know is what we had that room in the, in the gym yeah. was probably the most ecumenical. It was, uh, it was, it was. And, uh, yeah, when I tell people about that, they can't believe it, but it was true. It, it was wonderful. I mean, I, I got more ideas from there. I, I was accepted as a person. I was accepted for who I was. Yeah. Uh, I was respected, yeah. and uh, yeah, yeah. That that group of what I call the core runners of our generation at Ball State was a pretty unusual group because they represented almost every discipline you could. Well, think I mean, you have Bill Renke, who was you yeah. know this, was this erudite professor, yeah. you know, yeah. would come in and tell a dirty joke, yeah. and it was just. It just humanized. It made everything really seem. I mean, we didn't slap each other with towels, but it was almost right. like that. I mean, yeah. it, was, it was that that camaraderie, which you don't get in a department. If you do, if, they, if, yeah. if some departments do that, I don't know where they are. They because, don't. They don't anymore because they all they all fight against each other. Right? We were. Yeah. There was too much jealousy within the department yeah. always that that, that that really hindered. Well, I, I think that was a great level. I mean, even through the time that I was provost, I mean, I still continued to do that, and it was really important for me. To go in there, you know, sort of in your birthday suit most of the time, where you were equal before anybody. Well, I think Kinghorn and I used to sit butt to butt, yeah. you know, on the same bench. She'd be on one side of the aisle, and I was on the other, but both of us bare naked, you know. <laughs> and uh, not that we ever talked about it. I mean, he was a graduate assistant at the time yeah. when I first came here, right. the first year I was here. And uh, but, but yeah, in, I mean, in fairness, once he got higher up in the administration, he quit doing that. And and I've always been critical of a lot of administrators at Ball State who. Who aren't really comfortable doing that kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, I used to kid John Wortham when he was president about the fact that he ought to come over at noon sometimes and work out, and just yeah. sit around and talk shop with people. I think he would have been better off for it. Oh, I think so. I, I sat at a table with him the other day uh, at, uh, when Mark Smith got his award, yeah. and I sat down at the table with him and uh, McKee and uh, Van Smith and. Uh, it was, yeah. But at any rate, you know, just and he's a great guy yeah. to talk to. I'm just just. Uh, yeah. Well, his, his response always, well, well, I got you doing that, so I don't have to bother you. Yeah. <laughs> what do you, you think about the role of, uh, of faculty within the governance system? I mean, do you think that faculty, as you look back, should have had more of a voice in decision-making? Absolutely. Decision -making? I, I think we have not had uh, enough, enough input from faculty. It, it, it's been a top-down administration. Okay. The, the, it's, 
you know, it's almost like a family-owned company. The ball, com ball, ball, court, ball <laughs> family owns Ball State. I mean, that, I, mean I, I know they don't, but yeah. that, that sort of get that feeling from them. I mean, I was on the Senate for a number of years, and uh, I was there all the time, and I never felt that our, our voice was really heard. Okay. And uh, it seemed to me that those people who were heard most were those who were um, part of the administration. Uh, do, you think that got, do you think that got worse as you went on at Ball State, or was it you think it was no. better when we came? Well, oh, I think it probably got better. I think we, I think we, we you know, obviously we're, we're much more cosmopolitan now than we were then. We were very insular when, we, when I first came here. And, uh, yeah, I think the fact that we had more to say, bringing the students in was had its good points, but also right. had some bad points in there too. The fact that the, the faculty voice then became even smaller. Yeah. It was never very large to start with, and then that, that made it even smaller. Changing it to the more minute, mm -hmm. uh, the more concentrated uh, Senate, I've only was on, I think I was only in there once right. after that happened. Do you think the faculty would have been better off if, they had a fa if there had been a faculty Senate? Yes, I think so. Okay. That's, my, that's my opinion, I, I, and uh, that's probably a minority opinion. Okay. Well, I don't think. It, well, I don't. Even, I was going to say today. I'm not so sure it is, but today, I think the faculty have changed so much that I think now more faculty care less about formal governance than was the case when we first came. Probably, yeah. yeah. Well, we're less we're less formal um, yeah. people as, yeah. as that stands. I mean, when I came how, here, we had to wear ties. Well, know? yeah. How, how do you how do you think the life of a brand spanking new assistant professor who joins your department is different than life was when you came here? Well, there was this attempt when I first came here to, to think of ourselves as a family. Uh, yeah. I don't think there's that much, okay. that kind of thing happening anymore. Right. It wasn't successful in my case. I think at that time it was beginning right. to break down right, right. At, right at that okay. time I came in. And bringing some of the people in that came in was right. uh, the cause of that. Okay. Um, I don't know, I think we have the mentoring system, which really is helpful, and... Uh, I think the pressure is greater because of the teacher-scholar model. Um, More pressure on younger faculty to get their publications and... Oh, absolutely, but they don't, they get time for it. You realize when I, when I, when I did my work, I was, <coughs> excuse me, I was, uh, teaching full-time, mm -hmm. as I said, 16 hours, and I was supposed to get my doctorate, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and I did. Uh, yeah. But I'm, I'm a hard worker, and I'm a, as I say, I'm a good, I mean, I, I write easily, so I don't have, mm -hmm. and I, st I, I learn right. fast. Okay. I'm intelligent, <laughs> and, and probably in the academic way, in, in an academic way, so I can, I can learn quickly, so I didn't have as much problem. In fact, I have taught, uh, I have had only one only two semesters that I know in my entire career that I had a reduced load from 12 hours. I have averaged at least 14 hours of teaching a semester. The whole time you were here? The whole time I was here. And from the time I was 50 to I was 65, I published over 100 articles. Not all referee, but yeah. I had 25 or so yeah. were refereed. Yeah. And, uh, let, let, me, let me switch to a kind of final uh, macro category, and, I, and that is I'd like you to comment on how you view the relationship between town and gown, Muncie community and Ball State, and whether you think it's changed over the time you've been here. It's amazing how, much, how similar it is from, from the time I got okay. here, I think. Okay. In many respects, there's still the resentment of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the gown okay. uh, by, the, by the many people in the community, and especially the people who are uh, you know, from the south end of town, and, and there's just been a tremendous amount of that in the paper lately. Why do you think that is? Well, I, I, obviously, it's the educational level, okay. I think. Right. Is, is you think it's blatant anti-intellectualism? Um, I don't think they recognize it as such, but oh, yeah, okay. I, think, I think so. Yeah. Um, there's this feeling, oh, you're a professor, you're superior to us. And, oh, okay. Uh, okay. and it's, you know, you know, you know the reaction you get when, right. when they find out who you are, right. that you're at the university, and, uh, yeah. oh, they've seen your name in the paper or something yeah, like yeah. that. And then, you know, it, it depends upon the person. You could either treat it with respect or with right. disdain, uh, right. because it means something to yeah. them. And, uh, okay. Uh, so you think it's pretty consistent from the time you came here? I don't see much difference. I mean, I see there's certainly we've made great attempts. I mean, you know, Tony right. Costello has done yeah. some wonderful things with, with uh, getting out into the community and helping to improve it. Uh, Kelly tries the same thing right. over there, and uh, uh, I, I, yeah, I guess he's been successful. I'm not too sure. Yeah. Not, not as much as Tony, but he's more of a he's more of a commentator. 
he's not got involved as much as Tony. Yeah, has. yeah. Well, I think he's wrong in many of the things he yeah. said, so that's why I got a problem with that. But then, you know, look at look at look at what's happening with with the development of the community. When we have uh, one of the best colleges of, of planning, or departments right. of, of planning, we have this College of Architecture and Planning, and and uh, and Muncie grows in. Yeah. I mean, it's it, 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 topsy, right. you know. <laughs> she just grows, and, and nobody yeah. controls it. And, and we have the rules in place, and then they blatantly ignore them, and, and nobody cares. And uh, so yeah. the gown has not much to say about the town's uh, well, I put that a little bit physical quality. Uh, put that a little bit differently. And this may seem a little bit selfish and maybe a little bit self-serving. My view is that the university does an incredible number of things for the community and mm -hmm. always has. Absolutely. And, and my yeah. comment would be that the unit that the town has never really appreciated all the things the university does for. I mean, do you think that I'm off on that? No, no. I think that's no, I think that's, that's true. I, you know, I, they but they most cases, like I said, some of them will, will revile you, some will honor you for being here right. at the university, and neither one of those particular attitudes yeah. towards you is correct. You know, it, it's it's a matter they don't understand us, yeah. and uh, and they think we're something we aren't. In some cases, they think we're <coughs> okay. better, or in some cases, they think we're worse. But uh, you know, you're right. We've done a tremendous amount of things for the university or for the community. And as I say, I did the things I did with the uh, the slide series for, mm -hmm. for the, right. the, the Elder County uh, community, yeah. whatever it was, the uh, Council of Churches. It yeah. has a different name. They changed names in the middle of it. But I did a lot of work with them, and uh, and that was that was a lot of fun and working with them. But I don't know that. When I show it, then, and for example, I showed something uh, on poverty, and I had a few slides in there of poverty uh, from uh, taken out of magazines. Yeah. That we're from a, uh, from another country. Yeah. And it was written up in the paper, yeah. and it said it said I showed s slides of, of poverty in various nations, <laughs> and almost all my slides were taken in Muncie, yeah, showing right. what was going on. Yeah. Now, the idea was yeah. to show where there were what poverty in Muncie was like, and, yeah. and uh, it was to, to help, uh, and there was only a few of them, but they focused on those slides, and they were saying that this is unimportant. Or yeah. What he said was fine, but that doesn't have anything to do with us, you know. So they, uh, that was the tone of the newspaper article. Those are the questions I have, but yeah. as with all of my interview people, I want to give you an opportunity to add any other reflections or comments on what I genuinely believe was a long and distinguished career at Ball State. So if there's anything else, Jim, that you'd like to add well, I for, think the for, for posterity? Well, I think the opportunity to travel, the fact that, you know, that I got that, op it was just wonderful to, to find out that I can travel. I think the first sabbatic, well, the first sabbatic I took, I went to the Bahamas and taught, talking about community service, that was a real service, although I didn't see it that way. I saw it as a chance right. to go to the Bahamas. Right. <laughs> yeah. But when I got there, I realized what I was doing was working with yeah. the, some of the world's poorest yeah. people. Uh, in the Bahamas, although uh, we were in the Bahamas, it sounds like a, you know, a vacation spot. It wasn't. It was it was a poor, yeah, dusty, right. dirty uh, area yeah. and uh, an out island. And most of the kids we worked with were Haitians, yeah. and uh, whose life there wasn't much better than it was in Haiti. They lived yeah. in cardboard shacks on land that they had. Uh, uh, what what's, what do they call it? Where uh, squatted? They were squatters on, on property yeah. and. Uh, the government was trying to get rid of them all the while, and we were trying to help them. And the, the kids were, you know, they were they were suffering from malnutrition right. and yeah. um, worked on it. But anyway, to be there and be in a third world country and have Wall State paying half my salary that year, that was fantastic. Yeah. We took all five kids down there. The youngest yeah. one was two when we went, yeah. and there were only seven years between my oldest and youngest. So we all of them went to that same school. Mm -hmm. So it was just fantastic. In fact, I just got a, a note from Sister yeah. Pat Springer this morning. Because she's now teaching in Dominican Republic, and she wants to be down there, and that's why I'm learning Spanish. Oh, okay. Because I'm going to go down to the Dominican right. Republic and work down there. Because somebody donated a large amount of equipment, yeah. woodworking equipment. They want to set up some kind of okay. shop, and I, they don't know exactly what they want. And I hopefully I can go down there and show them what they should have, and, and then help them set it up. I'm I'm going to be on my hands and easily hammering my hands. Yeah, and that's why I'm trying to learn Spanish. But uh, the opportunity to travel there, I went. I, I've been in Belgium, Holland, France. England two or three times, yeah. New Zealand and Australia and uh, mm. Kuala Lumpur and Malaysia. I, you know, I travel the world, and uh, it's helped me. I, I don't know what to tell your students because 
It was like the articles in the paper the other day said when, when the students go off and come back, nobody wants to really hear what they've done. You know, they don't want to hear about this. And you want to tell them all these wonderful yeah. things, you know. And even my wife doesn't want to hear about it when I come back. <laughs> Although she's gone with me. I, I'm from, in fact, uh, we, we presented in Paris one time together. Uh, I mean, her, she had one thing and I had yeah. another thing. Um, but, you know, nationally traveling around, and I finally did, became aware of what, what I should be doing uh, in service projects with our, my own field of education, and I got, as I say, I got involved in that, went to all the meetings, and I'm known now, I mean, it, right. by, the, peop by, the, by the, the National Society, I'm known as one of the experts, uh, two or three or four experts yeah. in the field of technology education, the elementary grades, and when they have a question, they ask me, I mean, they'll call me up and say, I need an article yeah. on such and such, you know, and I'll write it next week. The bad thing is I need it next week. Okay. So what you're really describing is that your reputation, for a variety of reasons, was much more significant outside the university than it was with a lot of your own colleagues. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm a little bit like Jesus Christ. Now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a bit of a stretch. But <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know, I know. But okay. it, exactly. And I think that, you know, and I became known, but I really had a fight to get that at that point. I, th I think anybody does. Was that a conscious, th a conscious thing that you did where you decided, you know, yes. things aren't going that great in my department, and so I know I can do this more on a national basis? Uh, probably not that so much, but recognizing yeah. that I needed to do those kinds of things yeah. and that I did know more than other people, and I really yeah. needed to tell people about what yeah. the way what, the way with the world ought to okay. be, and no, I, no, I, I want to... I I want to teach them about that, yeah. and okay. so in a small circle, mm -hmm. you know, obviously it's a very small circle, yeah. people who think I'm famous, you know. Well, yeah, you know, but there's only 10 or 12 of them. I was going to say, it's a pretty important field, though, as far as teaching kids. Yeah, the interesting thing is that in terms of influencing people, right. I had more influence on people writing the column for the Muncie Star than I ever did professionally, <laughs> okay? I mean, I improved people's <laughs> lives yeah. physically. I mean, I really should have gotten some grants from the phys ed department. Uh, Just getting them up off their butts. I did, and yeah. you don't know how many people who will still say, hey, I, oh, I got so much out of your column. I, you yeah. got me to do such and such and such and such. So that's well, I, I certainly feel that way about the adult fitness program. Yeah. I mean, I, I well, that's what it was connected with that. Yeah, every yeah. time, time I see Bud Getchell, uh, I, re I remind him that if he hadn't been instrumental in getting me involved, you know, when I was overweight and still doing a little bit of cigarette smoking and getting me out into, as I would call it, a life of running. Uh, which, of course, I'm still doing as best I can, that I'm not so sure I would have gotten up off my duff and done that. Yeah, I think Bud Getschel is probably one of the biggest influences on yeah. my life, really. When yeah. you talk about people, I go back to yeah. that, because uh, you say he stopped me from smoking. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, he, was, he encouraged me. I mean, he just he was very, very seriously. I mean, he would sit down with me and, yeah. you know, Jimmy, you've got to stop smoking, <laughs> you, got, you know, and you got to eat right. And you, yeah. you know, and uh, I remember one marathon we went to, I'd, I'd done, uh, I had only done one marathon, and we were all going to go do with this marathon. It was going to be the first one for the rest of us, my second. Yeah. And uh, he sat me down. He made me eat breakfast. I did not want to eat breakfast. You know, you, and so he sat down. I had a half an egg, and, or a piece of toast <laughs> and an egg. I went out, and I ran uh, 255 marathons. Jeez. You know? <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it, you know, yeah. it was his... He, all, ba all based on breakfast. <laughs> well, I, partly, part, partly, and, and, and also... Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, some other people. Like Jim, fair well, fair Jim Leffler, you're, you're, no, yeah. not Jim Leffler, Jerry Pierce, Jerry yeah. Pierce, remember Jerry? Sure. Uh, yeah. He's the one who convinced me I could do it, and then Getch will show me how to do it, I think is probably what it amounts to. Well, uh, any, anything else you want to add about your career at Ball State? Anything I don't know, well, my wife, you know, I, it's, it's been a nice place. I wish yeah. there had been other places. I wish I had gone other places mm -hmm. and, and done more things. I wish I had gone, taken more sabbaticals to mm -hmm. teach at another university okay. for a year. Yeah. That would have been cool, just yeah. to see where I... I fit in there, but yeah. having the opportunity to go, you know, to teach in the Bahamas, yeah. to wander around Europe, yeah. uh, uh, sometimes, I mean, I got there, uh, one of the nice things, I, I took uh, a semester off because I built up my overload, or, right. you know, I, 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 and I took the overload and then uh -huh. I just took off a semester, yeah. and that was great to be able to yeah. do that. And I well, I think a lot of us have been really exposed to some incredible international experiences. Uh, to be blunt on the university's dollar. Yeah, well, the, chi the China trips, for example. Oh, yeah. I was on that first one, and yeah. that was that, yeah, those, that was those, those were, I mean, really changed changed a lot of the way that we saw the rest of the world and saw a lot of other people. And it hadn't been for being on a university faculty that had international programs, I'm not so sure I ever would have done that. 
I'm uh, sure I would have gone to the Far East if it hadn't been for Jay Park. There's yeah. No question oh, yeah, that was Jay Park. And, yeah. uh, you know, and Jim Cook helped set up the program at Oxford, and I've certainly taken advantage of doing yeah. an awful lot of that. Anything else you want to add? Um, well, I'm grateful to the provost office <laughs> for supporting <laughs> some of that travel. <laughs> And, uh, and I, you know, if you think about that, the opportunity. We had a lot of money then. <laughs> well, and that was, you know, and I, I felt you owed it to me because you wouldn't pay me for that damn uh, course I taught in English. Uh, and that was so great to be able to do that, <laughs> to be able to teach that course on Paul Peru. Yeah. And uh, that was that was a wonderful opportunity, which, by the way, in my department caused me some grief. Really? Yeah, teach over world lines, you're working here. Yeah, you had a lot of fun doing it, though. Oh, yeah, I did. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I mean, I, I, I changed one guy's career. He became an English teacher. And <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> that, that was when he was, in fact, his father was an industrial arts teacher at the time. And <laughs> but he was happy that he did that. He was going to be an industrial arts teacher, and I talked to him into English. <laughs> well, no wonder my department any, more, gr any more grand finale comments? I don't know. What, uh, <laughs> you know I, I just felt that you know, there's been a tremendous amount of unfairness with, with the merit system. Okay. It just, you know, has never worked right. Mm -hmm. I don't know any department where it's worked right. Mm -hmm. And and having to leave the, all of the departments to come up with their own method of right. coming up with merit, I think was a big mistake. Mm -hmm. I think that there should have been something that was official and that was workable and that we could all work together on. Yeah. Where instead of having all these different departments fighting and working, and yeah. we, we was doing, oh, and we spent, I don't know, an untold number of hours evaluating everybody else's credentials. We did everybody else in the department. Right. I looked through everybody else in the department, looked at their credentials, and then they'd rate them and evaluate them. It took 40 hours, you know? As, as one of our colleagues said in one of my interviews, all for a couple hundred bucks. <laughs> well, and, and, and that my biggest gripe at the time was yeah. that, okay, the legislature said we wanted to have merit pay, you yeah. know, the, the, the Office Committee for Higher Education. Right. Committee, okay. Uh, filtered down to us the same way. Okay, well, we'll give you merit if you do this. Yeah. There was no merit. Yeah. They didn't give us any merit. They took money away from yeah. one guy and gave it to another yeah. guy. So all that did was cause all kinds of problems. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I came out okay on that. I came, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I left with the highest salary in the mm -hmm. department, and, uh, mm -hmm. but I did a lot of stuff. Yeah. Uh, and it did encourage me, don't get me wrong, it did, it did encourage me to do more of the writing and, uh, and, and to decide that I wanted to do some service kinds of things. Um, okay. But uh, I, I, I think it was. Uh, oh, it's still, it was it's done still, poorly. Still needs a lot more fine tuning. It was done poorly. It should, it, it, it should have been a university-wide system. Yeah. I mean, it's just like this. We just we had to define the role of the faculty, how, what uh, um, a member of the faculty has to do, you know, and it had to, to, to graduate faculty, what right. they had, and uh, what they could be a member. Of, and so we had to write it. Well, as soon as I saw it, I said, they know what you know, Jack, our department chairs, they know what they want. Yeah. Why don't they tell us what they want and we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll agree to it. Yeah. Or if we need to change it a little bit. Yeah. No, we had to send it through. Why that thing, went, it became laughable. Jack, and Jack was using me as his editor quite oh. frequently, and he'd send me this stuff. <laughs> I said, Jack, this is a, <laughs> it's just the same thing that yeah. you gave us earlier. And uh, I mean, you did, ask them what they want. Yeah. <laughs> and, and every time it kept coming, it'd come back and they'd tell us a little bit more what they wanted. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, <laughs> for almost a full year. Yeah. Until and it finally came back and they said, if, as long as you put these next two words in, it'll be okay. Yeah. And that, you know, it was, so there was too much of that kind of thing that went on, that, that, that caused the departments to do, uh, to make us think that we were in charge, <laughs> and we weren't. That's called the trivia of administrative bureaucrats. <laughs> I don't know, but it, it, it uh, well, there, there be a tremendous amount of yeah. bureaucracy and all that, and I, I think that, uh, yeah. you know, I, that bothered me a lot, and it, as a rebel, uh, as, right. uh, as I had been, I, I've always, you know, I've always been in somebody's ear and complaining about one thing or another. Um, okay, I, I think I'll end on that notes. note. Okay, well, that, well, let me see, let me see, what do you got? Well, that, those are all the questions. Well, I see the questions, well, so I'm not. sure I answer them. Well, I want to make sure I answer them. Hang on a minute. I think you've answered every one. <laughs> to, to a fairly well. Uh, do these changes, the changes positive or negative? I think it, you know, positive, sure. <laughs> Ball, Ball, Ball State has done some of the people. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> Jay Park, you can think about that. Bud Getchell, um, um, Bill Sargent, my first department yeah. chairman. Um, I don't know, as we, as we, we can sit here and tell stories for a sure. while. I say, oh, yeah, of yeah. course. 
and uh, Bill Hendy was uh, you know, yeah. just a good, good influence on me. Bill Renke, uh, yeah. you know, just seeing those kinds of people. Uh, it, 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 no, you covered the whole landscape here. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for participating in my stuff. You're welcome, Dr. Brandy.